Trudeau's carbon pricing plan. Premier of Newfoundland blames him for inflation in economy. The air is thick with controversy, as Trudeau's carbon pricing plan has been accused of stoking the flames of inflation. A policy designed to fight climate change has unexpectedly found itself at the center of an economic storm, with critics and proponents locked in a heated debate over its true cost to Canadians. Let's take a step back and understand what's at play here. The federal carbon pricing program is a strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by putting a price on carbon. It's built around the idea that making pollution more expensive will encourage businesses and consumers to reduce their carbon footprint. Alongside this, Canada has implemented a carbon rebate system, aimed at cushioning the economic blow for households. But the question remains, is this approach effective? Critics argue that the current prices are too low to make a real difference, while others insist it's one of the most efficient methods to cut down emissions. The World Bank Carbon Pricing Dashboard reveals a stark disparity in carbon pricing systems worldwide, highlighting the challenge of finding a one-size-fits-all solution. Proponents tout carbon pricing as a win for the environment, citing its potential to lead us towards a greener future. Critics, including Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, and Conservative leader Pierre Polyav, see it as a heavy burden on the economy, exacerbating an already challenging affordability crisis. The Liberal Party and other advocates counter that the plan is essential for reducing emissions and combating climate change, with the carbon tax being a necessary evil for a sustainable future. This introductory passage sets the stage for a comprehensive exploration of Trudeau's carbon pricing plan. As we navigate through this complex issue, we invite you to join the conversation and share your perspectives. Together, we'll examine the multifaceted impacts of this policy and what it means for Canadians from coast to coast. Simply put, carbon pricing assigns a monetary value to the pollution emitted by industries, capturing the social costs, like healthcare from heat waves or property loss due to flooding. This can take the form of a carbon tax or an emissions trading system, both aiming to reduce greenhouse gas, GHG, emissions by making polluters pay. Carbon pricing is not just about assigning costs, it's about changing behavior. It encourages businesses and consumers to shift towards greener choices, driving innovation in clean technologies and contributing to our international commitments under climate agreements. Carbon tax. This direct pricing method charges a fixed price per ton of GHG emissions, incentivizing less pollution through cleaner operations or fuels. Emissions Trading System, ETS, also known as cap and trade. This sets a cap on emissions and creates a market for emission permits, allowing flexibility in how reduction targets are met. Crediting Mechanisms. Projects that reduce emissions can earn credits, tradable to entities looking to offset their own emissions. Internal carbon pricing. Organizations may set their own carbon prices internally to prepare for future policies and encourage low carbon investments. Canada's federal government plays a pivotal role in implementing and regulating carbon pricing programs. They ensure the polluter pays principle is upheld, guiding the transition towards a more sustainable economy. Research shows that carbon pricing effectively reduces GHG emissions. But what does this mean for consumer prices and the economy? There's a trade-off. While some costs may rise in the short term, the overall economic impact is mitigated by long-term benefits, such as reduced climate-related damages and advancements in green technology. This brings us to the question, how has carbon pricing affected greenhouse gas emissions, consumer prices, and the Canadian economy as a whole? Studies suggest a decrease in emissions, but with varied effects on different sectors of the economy. For instance, while some energy-intensive industries may face higher costs, others could benefit from the push towards innovation and efficiency. Now, let's hear your thoughts. How do you see carbon pricing impacting your daily life and our collective future? Drop your comments below and let's get the conversation going. First up, we need to understand how this carbon pricing plan could be influencing inflation trends. Now, you might remember from our last section that carbon pricing is a tool designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by assigning a monetary value to pollution. It's all about creating a financial incentive for people and businesses to emit less. But, where does inflation come in? The plan increases costs for businesses, especially those heavily reliant on fossil fuels. These higher costs can then trickle down to consumers through elevated prices for goods and services. In theory, this could increase the overall cost of living, feeding into the inflation cycle. But it's not all so straightforward. We've got rebates and incentives in play that are designed to balance the scales. Keep this in mind as we delve deeper. Now, let me tell you. Newfoundland and Labrador Premier and Conservative leader Pierre Polyav has been vocal about his concerns. He's linked the carbon pricing program directly to what he calls an affordability crisis. Here's his take. He argues that the program is just another tax weighing down Canadians, adding strain to already tight budgets. Polyav points out the recent increase adding approximately 3.3 cents more per litre of gasoline, which for a 50-litre tank means a carbon surcharge of $8.80, about $1.65 more than before. By connecting the dots between carbon pricing and everyday expenses, 
Polyav is painting a picture of economic hardship. But is he right? Let's keep the conversation balanced and look at the other side. Supporters of carbon pricing, including the Liberal Party, have a different view. Their counter-arguments focus on long-term vision and sustainability. They emphasize the primary goal of reducing emissions and combating climate change. Proponents argue that while there might be short-term economic discomfort, the end game of a healthier planet outweighs these concerns. Additionally, they highlight the quarterly rebates families receive designed to help offset increased costs, with low-income households benefiting the most. To give you some numbers, according to the Canadian government, 8 out of 10 Canadian families will get more back from the rebate than they pay in carbon pricing. So, while it's essential to acknowledge the immediate pinch to the wallet, we also need to consider the bigger environmental debt we're facing. What do you think? Is the focus on the present-day bottom line blurring the bigger picture of our global responsibility? Or do we need to prioritize putting food on the table today over potential future benefits? As we wrap up this section, we encourage you to weigh in on this debate. Do the short-term economic effects of carbon pricing justify its long-term environmental goals? Your voice matters in this discussion, and we want to hear from you. Now, let's delve deeper into the broader economic ramifications that ripple out from this policy. We're talking about changes in the gross domestic product, GDP, industrial production, and unemployment rates, the big players in the economic arena. GDP. Implementing carbon pricing can have a cooling effect on GDP growth. Industries facing higher operational costs might scale back leading to a slower pace of economic expansion. Industrial production. As companies adjust to the new pricing, we might see a shift in production patterns, potentially reducing output in high-emission industries. Unemployment rates. With industries adapting or downsizing, there's the risk that jobs may be lost, inching up unemployment rates. But what does the research say? A study by Kanzig, 2022, gives us some hard numbers. It shows that while higher carbon prices do indeed lead to a significant increase in energy prices and a persistent fall in emissions, they also come with a cost. Output falls, consumer prices rise, and, yes, unemployment gets a bump too. This isn't just an environmental conversation, it's an economic one as well. It's a classic dilemma, the immediate pinch versus the future gain. On one side, there's the undeniable short-term economic sting from carbon pricing, the job losses, the potential dip in GDP, and the higher consumer prices. Yet, on the flip side, we're playing the long game for the planet, aiming to reduce emissions and mitigate climate change's costly impacts like property damage and global income losses totaling over $1.8 trillion. I want you to think about this. Is the immediate economic discomfort a price worth paying for a healthier environment and a more sustainable future? Globe Moneybag. Let's hear your thoughts in the comments below. And remember, stay informed, stay curious, and keep the conversation going. Your voice matters in shaping the future of our economy and our planet. Now, let's shift our focus to an equally critical aspect. The success of the federal carbon price as a climate policy measure in Canada. We're going to unravel the complexities, gauge public sentiment, and assess the policy's effectiveness in meeting environmental goals. First up, how does one measure success when it comes to policy? Well, the federal carbon pricing system has been a cornerstone of Canada's climate action. Since its implementation in 2019, there has been a consistent effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and here's the kicker. The economy hasn't just survived, it's thrived. A striking figure to note is that 80% of Canadians get more cash back in climate action incentives than what they shell out in higher energy costs. The carbon tax isn't just about the dollars and cents. It's been pivotal in driving climate action forward. It's a prime example of a policy that nudges both individuals and businesses towards greener choices. Despite the legal challenges thrown its way, the carbon tax has stood its ground, demonstrating robustness and resilience. It's not just surviving, it's setting a precedent for climate policies worldwide. Now, let's talk about the people. Public perception can often make or break a policy, and it seems the carbon pricing system has managed to garner considerable political support. It's a hot topic, no pun intended, but overall, Canadians recognize the importance of taking steps to combat climate change. The policy's design, which returns funds to taxpayers, plays a big role in this acceptance. When we turn our gaze to the environment, the verdict on carbon pricing's effectiveness is still out. While emissions have dipped since 2019, pinpointing the exact contribution of carbon pricing is challenging. It's part of a broader climate strategy, after all, but with a 53 million ton reduction in emissions between 2019 and 2021, it's clear that carbon pricing is a piece of the puzzle in Canada's climate response. Before we wrap up, did you know about the incentives tied to carbon pricing? For instance, a family of four in Alberta can receive up to $1,544 annually. Does that change your view on carbon taxes? We've seen that while the system isn't perfect, it's making strides in the right direction. It's a delicate balance between environmental stewardship and financial viability. What are your thoughts on this approach to tackling climate change?
Drop a comment below, share your insights, and don't forget to hit the like button if you found this discussion enlightening. Until next time, keep the conversation going.